Hello, hello, good evening, and welcome to Brog Chattery 777. Well, we're talking about Jethro Tull. We've made it to 1973, the follow-up to A Thick as a Brick. This is a passion play. Um, definitely a very famous album amongst the fans. Very controversial album. Um, basically, this is, a, this is another 40-minute epic, quite similar to Thick as a Brick. Uh, but it's nothing like Thick as a Brick. Thick as a Brick is very lighthearted. It's a joke in a lot of ways. Uh, it's very accessible, like, you know, the way Thick as a Brick is arranged, we get lots of uh, repeating themes and lots of, uh, you know, the melodies are very strong and they link it all together in a way that's easily digestible. Whereas this album features very little repetition. I mean, there is sort of a chorus that pops up, uh, you know, there was a rush along the Fulham Road. We get that, you know, maybe three or four times, but for the most part, this is just a relentless, onward, thrusting album. Um, and it's quite heavy, actually. Uh, the, there, there's, there's less of the acoustic, the nice acoustic guitar stuff that Anderson is so very good at. And it, it's more of the band kind of firing on at all cylinders. Uh, we get the same lineup that was on Thick as a Brick, so we got Ian Anderson on guitar and vocals, John Evan on pianos, Martin Barr on guitars, um, Barry Barlow on the drums, and Jeffrey Hammond Hammond on the bass, who, again, delivers a great performance on this. For, for someone who technically wasn't, you know, a trained musician, he, he gives a wonderful performance on this album. Um, it's also very dark. Um, Thick as a Brick is loaded with lightheartedness, and there's a lot of humor, although it's heavy as well. I mean, there, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of seriousness in Thick as a Brick as well, but for the most part, it's, it's lighthearted and fun. This is this is very serious. It's it's not a joke. You know, they they try to do the prog thing for for real. Right? They're they're really trying to expand the frontiers of music and that. Um, and I think I think that might be why Ian Anderson himself has reservations of it. Is you know it's it's a bit too convoluted and self-important maybe. But um, you know I I really like the album and I I always uh, for a very long time I used to say this was much better than Thick as a Brick, but. Um, I think I disagree with myself now. I think, you know, ultimately, Thick as a Brick is, is the better album, but this this is wonderful. This is a wonderful piece of um, Jethro Tull. And, you know, they never really did anything like this after. They never really did it did anything like it before. I mean, obviously, it's easy to compare it to Thick as a Brick and say, oh, yeah, it's another 40-minute piece, but it's really nothing like Thick as a Brick. It's set up as a play, as you could expect from the title. Uh, it's broken up into... Um, into Four movements, or like, or four um, uh, distinct sections. Uh, four acts. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, although it's hard, it's very difficult to tell as you listen where those acts are. Um, but yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm, this is this is the uh, fancy fancy reissue that I picked up. I think it was released in 2014 or something like that. And uh, you know, check it out. It's wonderful. Like, look at all this reading material you get. Um, it also talks about the making of this album, which I'll talk about in a bit. Let me talk about the album itself first. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, if, if, I recommend you pick this up, because it is wonderful. We get CD1 as A Passion Play, uh, remixed by Stephen Wilson, which is good, because there was some production, production issues on the, on the original release, I think. And Stephen Wilson did a great job of putting it all, getting it sounding fresh and nice. And uh, CD2 is the Chateau Duraville Sessions, which uh, became known as the Chateau Disaster Tapes. It's basically the lost album, the lost follow-up. There's, there's kind of a... There's an album that Tull almost did, but ultimately didn't. And again, we'll talk about that in a bit. We're talking about the Passion Play album, though, the actual thing that was released. Um, and yeah, God, where do you start? It's a, it's a, it's a massive work. Uh, Lyrically, like I said, it's very dense, it's very complicated, it's not very welcoming, and for the most part it's quite dark. I mean, there is bits of humor in there, but, you know, the actual, the lyrics are about, you know, the consensus is, is that it's about uh, a man's, a man's trials in the afterlife. And, uh, I mean, you, you get the sense that every single line means something or another, but, you know, the, the, it, it's very difficult to decipher. I mean, they're very cryptic in a lot of cases. Um, so yeah, it opens with, uh, uh, Act 1, which is, I just want to make sure I get this right, I think I got it in my head, but I want to make sure I say the right name. 
Da 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 da. Act one is Ronnie Pilgrim's funeral, a winter's morning in the cemetery. Um, it starts out with life beats and prelude. As we get little songettes, even though it is all one bit. Unlike Thick as a Brick, we do get little titles to go along with um, the whole thing. Uh, and Life Beats is, uh, we, we get the sound of a heartbeat um, imitated by a bass drum, courtesy of Barry Barlow. Um, same year, the same, same year that uh, Pink Floyd did it, so, you know, hmm, something's going on in 1973, evidently. Um, that winds its way, that, that kind of builds up. We also, we also, uh, as the heartbeat goes through, we are introduced, uh, uh, we already heard Ian Anderson sax playing on Thick as a Brick, but, uh, there is a lot of sax playing on this, and I like it personally. I mean, obviously he's not John Coltrane, but <laughs> um, I, I think he's a spirited player. And uh, like that intro, like doo -doo 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 not doing it right, but when when it winds up, we get the first big jabs of the bass and the drums, and then it kind of picks up into that uh, exciting shuffle. Like that, that, that's some really really great stuff, and it's kind of like a nice overture to the whole thing. Uh, goes into it. It's a really nice instrumental, actually. Um, winds its way into, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to go through each of these little sections, but, uh, when the first bit of song comes in, it's a nice little bit of, uh, piano and, um, piano and Anderson's voice. It's, it's kind of mellow, actually, the opening bit of lyric, and, uh, you know, once it, once it picks up, it's kind of relentless, and it just keeps, it, it just keeps on going and going and going. Um... Memory Bank, Best Friends, that's a highlight section. All of your best friends, telephones. Uh, really, really good. Um, again, like, there, there's there's less acoustic folkiness on this album. And, you know, it is, it is more the band just rocking out and just, you know, giving giving their audience 110% volume and loudness and heaviness as possible. And that's probably, I think that was a result of Ian Anderson's frustrations with the crowds he was dealing with. Because, you know, I think at his heart he is kind of a folky guy, and he likes these, you know, softer little acoustic pieces. And, you know, obviously Tall was such a huge band, and they had, you know, enough heavy songs to make a heavy metal kind of audience, you know, hard rock audience come to their shows. And so he found it very difficult to play these little acoustic -y things, so... When when they get to doing uh, passion play, you know the you know there, there's the acoustic -y intro, but then the album is just da -na -chika -da -na -chika -chika, and it just keeps on going. Uh, like I've said, the big highlight of uh, side one is Critique Oblique. I think uh, Ian Anderson actually played that last year, or maybe it was the year before with uh, with his current band. I thought that would have been a highlight of the set. I didn't see that tour, but that's really really cool. Love Critique Oblique. Uh, then it goes into Forest Dance, which leads us to the little uh, Sieg in the middle. Story of the hare who lost his spectacles. This might be my least favorite part in the album, but like I said, it serves a purpose. It's a nice bit of comic relief. Uh, and on the original vinyl, it's split right in the middle. So you, uh, it's narrated by Jeffrey Hammond Hammond, by the way. Very funny, very silly, fun-spirited. Uh, and the vinyl cuts them off right in the middle, and then you put the, the needle back on, and it just carries right on, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of like, you know, a bit of Python-esque, silly storybook humor. It's like the intermission. Um, and that, that's, <clears throat> like I said, that, that finishes side one of the album. Uh, and the, the other act of side one was uh, The Memory Bank, a small but comfortable theater in a cinema, with a cinema screen the next morning. I forgot to mention that on side one. Uh, we flip the album over, we get, uh, well, again, the second half of story of the Hair Who Lost His Spectacles, and we go into Act 3, which is called The Business Office of G. Audi and Son, two days later. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, again, it, this, the album kind of kicks off again with the forest dance acoustic theme, and it uh, goes into a nice little bit of uh, acoustic-y bit. And kind of like the first side of the album, it starts with a bit of acoustic, and then it just goes off into crazy, rocky territory. Uh, which is really, really good. Like, the Overseer Overture bit is really, really, uh, there's a real highlight. Um, there's a great melody that comes in the second half of the album, that... That's a real highlight of the whole album for me. I love that, that little bit. Fantastic. Um, and then Act 4 called Magus Purday's Drawing Room at Midnight. Um... We get Flight from Lucifer, 1008 to Paddington, and it goes into the big Magus Perde grand finale, the shocking uh, Martin Barr acoustic guitar. Dun, 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 
Dun -dun -dun. Um, and yeah, it, it, like, it, it's hard to talk about because it's so dense, and you know, I'm just kind of spitting words out here as I do, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. It has a really weird ending, too. We go, we go back into one of the, doom, doom, bam, 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 which is a theme that's earlier in the second half of the album, I think, and, uh, he yells, Steve, Pola! Which I think, I think is a reference to some journalists at the time that were talking smack. Anderson kind of talks smack back a little bit, which is very unlike his character today, but he did back then. Uh, but yeah, I've probably been going on way too long already, but I, I want to make at least a, a quick mention to the Chateau Duraville ses sessions, which, like I said, on this in this wonderful special edition uh, four-disc package of awesomeness, we get uh, we get the incompleted album, um, and Stephen Wilson did a remix of those too. And the thing is, it's 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 really really good. Um, the story goes, uh, you know, after they're hot on the heels of Thick as a Brick, they went to France to record uh, the follow-up, and everything went wrong. Like the, the studio flooded, and the soundboard got screwed up, and then like one of the engineers quit on them. Or they, they'd be, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just kind of going from memory. I mean, a lot of that might be incorrect. But basically, everything went wrong, and the band gave up, and they went to uh, London, and Ian, Ian Anderson kind of took little bits that they were working on in France and uh, wrote a few new bits and put Passion Play as we know it together in like two weeks or something like that, which is, you know, insane, really. I mean, you, th you think he was under so much pressure and he put together another 40-minute concept album in like a week or two. That that's impressive, because I think a Passion Play is still very, very good. Not as good as Thick as a Brick, but it's very, very good. Um, but yeah, the, the, the album that they almost completed in France, kind of, there, there's some... Uh, it was going to be a concept album, you know, the original Fall of the Thick as a Brick, and it was it was talking, of, you know, kind of comparing um, animal stereotypes with people and vice versa, uh, which is funny because, uh, of course, Roger Waters famously did that with Pink Floyd and with animals, but uh, Jethro Tull kind of beat him to the draw <laughs> quite uh, um, quite a few years earlier. Animals is, what, 77, I think? I'll have to double-check that. And Passion Play is uh, 73, or the... Chateau Disaster Tapes, it would have been 73 as well. Um, also notable about them is we get Skating Away on the Thin Ice of the New Day, as well as Only Solitaire, which is uh, another uh, one of those jabs at the critics, but they would both end up on uh, War Child, the next album. Um, what else is it? Critique Oblique is a real highlight from uh, Chateau Disaster Tapes. It's it, There's got a bit of the lyrics in there. Um, they're a little bit different, and then it's essentially just this huge collection of themes from um, a passion play, which is great to listen to. I mean, it, it, the band was absolutely on fire. I mean, they were playing so well together, um, and you know, they were they really were a, a great team. Um, there's something else I was thinking of. There's probably would have been worth mentioning. Oh yeah, the the funny bit in Critique Oblique on the Passion Play album, your little sister's immaculate virginity winged away in the bony shoulder of a young horse named George. Should have said that like five minutes ago, but uh, I really like that bit. That's a little highlight. Uh, but I think I've blathered on long enough. I hope you enjoyed my chat. Um, you know, it, it's essential prog tall Passion Play, um, and if you can, uh, pick up this version of it if you're if you're a fan. Uh, because it is so worth it to have that Chateau Disaster tape um, put back together. So we can kind of, we can, you know, it's obviously it's not a complete album, but we can hear what the completed album might have sounded like, which is super cool for us, us nerdy fans. So, uh, yeah, Passion Play is, is an essential classic uh, and a controversial one, and, um, you know, it's worth checking out for sure. Uh, up next is War Child, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, send a like and a subscribe and throw me some comments because I like comments. Comments are fun. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time for War Child. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you then.